Looks like we are ready to go, so I would like you all to give a very warm uh, Shmukan welcome to Sean Gallagher, Steve Reagan, and uh, Paul Wegensell. They'll be talking about hacking the news. Hello. Hey. We are cognizant that we are the last talk before the party, so Just we're going to make this as interactive as possible towards the end. We're going to move along quickly. I'm Sean Gallagher. This is Hacking the News. This is an infosec guide to the media and how to talk to them, or rather not talk to them, if that's what you really prefer. We're all journalists here, or at least up on stage. I'm Sean Gallagher the Ars of Ars Technica. I'm the IT and National Security Editor. I'm Paul Wagenseal of Tom's Guide uh, and Laptop Magazine. I'm the uh, security editor at both of them, I guess. Steve Reagan, senior staff writer at CSO Online. And uh, as we start off for today, uh, what we're going to do is give you kind of an idea of what our day looks like, which is why you see a man screaming at the laptop right now, because this is uh, how we go about our mornings for the most part. We uh, see a lot of strange pitches and a lot of weird story tosses that come our way. And part of this talk is going to explain how to deal with uh, the media on the context of not only getting your story out there or adding to a story, but how to do it in a way that doesn't leave you or your company exposed. This is also how I look when I see the morning news. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to explain a few things about the media. First of all, we're going to give you a basic explanation of the different types of media and how they work, why you would ever want to talk to people in the media versus what the media needs from you and why they would talk to you, and how to package your message for the media. We're also going to talk about some other tips and tricks for dealing with journalists and understanding how they operate and give you a little bit of hints on OPSEC and how to deal with them. Uh, and then we're going to take as many of your questions as we can. But before we start, uh, save your questions for the end. Uh, we'll have probably have about 10 minutes or longer since the last talk of the day to, uh, to answer. And have witty banter and heckling, heckling and so on and so forth. And uh, we have slides available upon request. And I think this is being filmed. So. <clears throat> so first up, what is the media? I mean, you'd ask Marshall McLuhan that, I guess. But the media is a delivery vehicle for information. For our purposes, we're talking about news media. Everybody who's in media uh, is, every, there are many types of media. All of you are in media right now. You're being recorded by video. We are, but the main vehicles we're going to talk about are news broadcasts, news publications, both print and online. And <coughs> blogs are also media, and they increasingly become part of the more established media as people from the blogging community become regular reporters. But nevertheless, most people can still get their information from the television news, broadcast media, um, which is usually the least informed and the least de detailed. Um, the main thing you got to know about TV news is, uh, well, frankly, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, if it's sexy or dangerous or, or controversial, that's what you want to hear. That's what you want to put on the air. If it's nuanced or detailed, it's not such a good story. Um, the best stories for TV news can be summed up in about 10 seconds. <clears throat> Anything more than that is too complicated. Uh, any story is only going to get about five or minutes of the most, more likely two minutes. And uh, you get a little more time with stuff like, like news magazines or even like the news channels, like Fox News Channel or CNN, but those are sort of devolving into in shout fests sometimes. But nevertheless, those do have panel discussions where you can kind of get a little more into detail. Um, the same thing goes for NPR, radio discussion stuff, usually five or ten minutes on a topic, stuff that's a little more in depth. Now, the way that broadcast media works is the person you see on air is not necessarily the person driving the story. The person running the story is the producer who basically pitches the story to the editors, determines whether or not it gets a slot in the lineup for the day or the evening, um, fights for the story, gathers the facts, checks the facts, often writes the script. The person on the air is the talent who is not always a producer. If the talent is not the producer, the talent really will know nothing about the story. So he, he or she is just kind of reading the story and a pretty face. Print media, that's all three of us. Uh, print media in, used to be really well-defined. It was things that were printed on dead trees. And now it's magazines, weblogs, newspapers, news websites, 
And it's important to remember that bloggers are considered print media now. Most journalists in print media are, just like in broadcast, they're generalists. However, they have much more of a specification of the beat area they cover. So you'll have a national security reporter, a technology reporter, general areas of coverage. They will have some domain knowledge in those areas, not as much as at some publications that specialize in a topic, uh, especially at national publications. But if you're dealing with a general publication, there will be people who have certain larger areas of domain knowledge. And then if you're dealing with somebody at a publication like the ones we work at, we have very specific domain knowledge, well, relative to the rest of the media. Uh, and we go even deeper on things. So the important thing to remember in dealing with all print media is that the same rule sort of applies as from the broadcast media. If it bleeds, it leads is still a rule. If it's controversial, it's going to be above the fold on the front of the printed newspaper. It's going to be on the cover of the magazine. It's going to be the first story on the website. Some journalists have freedom to cover whatever they want to cover uh, within their beat, but others get assigned stories by an editor. So depending upon what news group you're dealing with, you may have maybe be working with somebody who's actually been doing some research on something on their own and is driving towards a story they're developing, or they may have been assigned a story by an editor as either a freelancer or as a staff writer, and they may have no introductory knowledge into that topic. Uh, print, print journalists often run on deadline. So just like in the news media, there's a news cycle. In, the, in, in broadcast, there's a news cycle. The news cycle for print used to be very fixed. There's a deadline at the end of the day. You had to push a newspaper out the door, or we had a weekly magazine. You had everything through the printer. Now it is every hour. So there are many of us who run and write multiple articles a day, and we're juggling multiple stories. So we're juggling multiple deadlines. And so we have to stay on top of all of those. And we're always being pressed to get more content up so we can get more page views. There are different types of articles we write in print. You know, there's long form stories that are more nuanced, informative, may go into more detail. Uh, there's short news stories. We, we used to call them briefs, which frequently are either just a breaking story headline plus a few lines of information about what happened, or it's a rewrite of something that we got some, from someplace else. Um, there's also you know, those wonderful things called slideshows, where we take a bunch of images and get you to click through them as many times as possible so we can view as many ads as you get to see, right? Though, not my and, favorite. Uh, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. They pay bills. Hey, good. Hey, All right. I click the slides. And an important distinction to make, there's this thing called the op-ed page in many publications, or we will run articles that are labeled op-ed. Those are not news journalism. Those are opinion. Those are editorial. Those are written either by someone who's supposed to be an expert in the field or as someone who is semi-informed in the field who wants to express an opinion. This is not the same as journalism. You cannot hold those things to the same standard as reporting. So you have to be aware of that when you're screaming at somebody on the op-ed page in the New York Times. They're not a reporter. They're expressing an opinion. And then there are blogs, and blogs have gone from being the hot new thing that everybody has in 1999 to becoming a form of print media now. So sites like Gizmodo and, and, and quite frankly, Ars Technica started as group weblogs or even as web boards and became print media. So when it comes to talking to the media, that's why a lot of you are in the room. And as I look out, I can see a handful of you who I know for a fact have had experience talking to the media before. And some of what I'm going to say will make sense to you, but for the rest of you, when it comes to dealing with the media, the first thing you want to do is know why you're going to want to talk to the media. So you, if you want to add to a story you've seen, so let's say somebody's covering a vulnerability and you know of two additional ways to use that in an attack that that wasn't mentioned in the story. Well, you'd probably reach out to the reporter and you'd talk to him a little bit and say, hey, I have additional information. The other side to that is the reporter may contact you and want to talk to you because you may have additional information. But before you deal with the media or you start to talk to them, it's a good idea to have a plan in place. You need to know what you want to say, how you want to say it. 
You need to know everything there is to know about that topic so you can anticipate questions, you can anticipate sidestepped answers, you can deal with anything that may come up into that interview. And that's not as easy as it sounds because sometimes you're going to be asked a question you're not entirely sure about. And so you're going to have to either do some quick research or come up and say, hey, I don't know. Let me get back to you. And you'll figure it out as you go. But another thing you need to remember, and this goes back to the it bleeds, it leads type of mentality, is if you're talking to a reporter and the story idea or thought you have requires any kind of skilled knowledge or, or nuance, like a deep understanding of the field, it ain't going to fly. Most people, their eyes will glaze over and you won't be able to get your point across at all. And if you can, you're going to have to translate. And what that means is you're going to need to take a very complex topic and distill it down into something that's going to last about 60 seconds. If you can do that, you're going to be fine. If you can't, you're going to have to work on it. So one exercise I want you guys to, uh, to think about here is try to imagine how you would explain a DDoS attack to somebody who has no idea what that is or why it's important. And I want you to do that in 60 seconds. If you can do that in 60 seconds, there really isn't a topic that you can talk about that's going to trip you up. And you'll be able to convey a lot of points to the media. And that's actually important because the more skilled, knowledgeable people we get talking to the press, the better the press is going to be when it comes to recording and reporting on security issues. We really, really need more experts to talk to the media. Seriously. Good. We do. Okay. Let's talk about your needs and our needs. Sometimes you want to talk to the media. You've got something you want to get off your chest. It may be because you want to serve a public service or you want to do something that gets people's attention about something. The media has a need, too. We have a hole to fill. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I tried. I tried. I tried. Right. So our needs are not always the same as yours. All right? Okay? <laughs> Our needs may be kind of strange, <laughs> but honestly. So what we want for a story or what some other journalists might want for a story may totally differ from what you, the message you want to get across. So you need to be prepared <laughs> for that. So why would a reporter want to talk to you? Or why would you want to talk to a reporter? So first of all, if you're approaching a reporter, you may be doing it because you've got some special thing that you need to get off your chest about this latest volume, right, or something like that. But it may also be because you want to raise your personal profile, uh, raise your professional profile within your community, raise the profile of your company, attract new business. Right? You are acting as a spokesperson for your company or for your business or your organization. You are putting a face in front of your organization. But reporters don't always understand what role you're playing when you come to them. If uh, the reporter has any sort of formal training, they may have read the investigative, journals, investigative journalist's handbook and they've gone through the whole matrix of what the motivations of different sources are. Uh, why are you coming to a reporter? They will ask themselves, why are they coming to me to tell me this story? Uh, they may have some misconceptions about the information security community. They may think that you're all cyber elite hacker lords and you're coming to like bring news of doom. Uh, they may have some questions about your legitimacy because they've heard all this other stuff from like NBC or someplace about how hackers are bad. Uh, they may be put off by the way you approach them. So there are some publications that are really happy to take anonymous contributions into a Dropbox or something like that. Uh, but most organizations will put priority on people who approach them in a business-like way or through a PR professional, say. I know there are a few in the room who could help you out if you want them to. Um, but the real thing that makes the news happen is what makes a reporter come to you in the first place. And the may reason may only be because you happen to be available. Whoever answers the email first, that's my source because I'm on a deadline. I got to get the story out. So is this person semi-credible? Do they answer my email? Sure. Okay, they're my source. Um, previous exposure. This person has some credibility because they've been reported on before. I see them talk at ShmooCon. I've seen them talk at DEF CON. Okay, I know that they're a real a reliable source. Assumed knowledge based on prior 
exposure. We understand what you may already know. Why do I go to you? Because I know you're an expert, or an expert in this field. Uh, or you just responded to my email. <laughs> the last reason, and the one <clears throat> that happens at a lot of publications these days, is that you have already been determined to be counted upon to give a controversial response to whatever they, the question of the day may be. All right? Or you're going to have a sensationalized view of something. <laughs> I'm just fascinated by the guy eating Tide Pods. <laughs> oh, man, it's amazing. Can we have some? Can we, can we have some Tide Pods? They're delicious. I prefer my Tide in liquid form. <laughs> Oh, man, you kids. You've got your Tide Pods. Oh, man. Dude, these are great. <laughs> sure. Mm. Like Yummy Tide oh, Pods. Why not? Why not? As, oh, long as, as, long as, as long as we're uh, all going down the rabbit hole together. Yeah. <laughs> See, back in my day, Tide came in liquid form, but, you know, this would be fine. We just, we just snorted it. <laughs> so... Let's go back to the idea that you want to add something to a story or you think you, you have an idea you want to pitch. And so you want to talk to a reporter. The next thing you need to do is know what reporter to talk to. And how do you know that? How do you know that a given reporter is the one that's right for you or to tell your story or get your point across? And the honest, hard truth to that is you don't know. And even if you did all your research, it could be wrong that, you know, your story gets completely out of control and whatever you thought was going to be in the media just doesn't happen anymore. But one of the ways you can do to try and avoid that is to know as much about the reporter and their publication as possible. And you do that simply by reading. But you read more than just what's in the, the current headlines. You look at the reporter and some of the other stuff they've written. How, what's their tone like? Are they particularly positive about a, a given area? Are they negative about a given area? Are they really, really stringent and they say straight in the middle? They never stray one way or another? Do they not have opinions? Do they have opinions? These things all weigh in because if you've got a story about a new vulnerability that could impact playing cards and wine glasses, do you really want to go and talk to a political reporter about that? Is that the right fit? No. But then again, what if this, this vulnerability or story impacts the broader audience? Then do you go to trade publication like myself, or would you go to a wider audience like Ars Technica? The answer to that would be you'd go wide whenever possible. So once you know as much as you can about the reporter, things get a lot easier for you because now, after the first few conversations, you can start doing uh, relationship building almost. And a good relationship with a reporter is a wonderful thing. It, it could really seriously take a lot of stress and you've learned, you'll become a, a, a reliable source for that reporter, but also that reporter will become someone you know you can trust to actually deliver credible, accurate, factual news. And like I was saying earlier, we need experts in the media, especially in security, to come out and start talking. Because the public, frankly, is scared. And I, I refer you back to, um, oh, there was this chip vulnerability that, uh, it was like a specter thing that melted down half the internet. I don't remember how it went about. But point was, when the mainstream media covered that and it went public on the nightly news, it seemed like the sky was falling and everything like that. When We screamed at yeah. the television. <laughs> yes, we did. As one voice, we screamed <laughs> at the television. And while... <laughs> While it is a serious situation, you know, we're not, <laughs> laptops aren't catching on fire. <laughs> but if you were reading the, uh, the, the, the teleprompter and seeing how some of the stuff was being covered, that's exactly what it looked like. And we need experts to avoid stuff like that. So, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> how many of many people here have had experience talking to the media? One, two, three, four. That's yeah. a pretty oh, good six. amount. Six, okay, good. Well, like that half the room. That's pretty good. How many of you understand the media has rules that it follows? Uh, you, not... you two can't answer. You're, yeah. you're too experienced yeah. with those. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most important rules is how, is how you treat a source. And it's really important that you understand that before you speak to a reporter because it helps you protect yourself. Uh, before you speak to a reporter, 
you have to make sure the conversation falls into one of three categories, on the record, off the record, or on background. Now, on the record is pretty straightforward. Your name will be used, you will be identified, and what you say can or will be used against you. Quoted verbatim. That's pretty straightforward, everyone understands that. On background is you don't want your name used, but you want the reporter to understand this, and he, you can give the reporter permission to use it. Um, you often are not directly quoted, but you're sort of like, you know, sources say, uh, we've heard that, so on and so forth. Anonymous sourcing kind of falls into this category, although sometimes you get direct quotations with that. And then there's off the record, which is kind of the most important part, the most important thing to understand. Um, this is where you don't want your name used, you don't want what you say being used, you're really just kind of telling the reporter as a person so that maybe he or she can understand something for the future or, or understand the context of something, uh, maybe to help frame the story, but it's not going to go in the story. Now, on the, off the record, you really only want to use with someone you trust, someone you've worked with before, someone you know well, someone you know is going to honor your agreement. Because believe it or not, there's no, no legal like penalty for, for breaking off the record or for abusing any of these, 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 these categories. Uh, there's no hard and fast rules, it's just these are rules that reporters tell themselves. Um, if you've seen that, that uh, book about Trump that came out lately, Fire and Fury, there are allegations that the author, Michael Wolff, took off the record conversations and put them in the book. That's an ethical no-no. We wouldn't do that. But he doesn't care about burning sources. We do. We don't want to do that. We, we have credibility to maintain in this industry, and we fought hard to, to get it, and we want to keep it. So <clears throat> anyway, moving on. Once you establish that line of communication, you kind of want to make sure who else is involved. If your company has a PR team or a PR agency, you want to get them involved as soon as possible. If a reporter reaches out to you, get your PR team involved and have them respond to the reporter. If you're reaching out to a reporter them yourself, maybe the PR team can do the, do the reaching out for you. Often, uh, I've been talking to people on the phone and there's a PR team listening in. That isn't totally necessary, but sometimes I insist on it. Likewise, if I'm communi communicating with a reporter via email, this, the PR team is often CC'd. Um, it's really to protect you and to protect your company. Um, and a lot of companies, if you don't do this, if you kind of you know, go off the reservation and speak to a reporter on your own, you could lose your job. Now, when you're pitching a story, you kind of want to downplay the product that you're selling. You want to downplay your company. You don't want to seem, don't want to make it too, seem too, too, too mercenary. You want to talk about the story and the interest and, and why it's useful for people to know this, the situation or not. It's nice that your company happens to provide a solution, but don't make that too obvious. Don't pitch your product. Don't pitch your services. Pitch the story. Don't pitch you. Anyway. <clears throat> Steve. <clears throat> so another thing that happens during an interview, uh, sometimes before and almost immediately after, goes back on what I said earlier when it comes to uh, being prepared before you talk to the media, and that is fact checking. Fact checking is a way of life. I know there are times when it seems like this doesn't happen, and you wonder you know, if fact checking even exists anymore, but I promise you it does, which is why whenever you're talking to the media, the more prepared you are, the easier fact checking goes. But it's a hard and fast rule that you should never talk to a reporter about something you cannot prove. Don't speculate, don't guess, and more importantly, don't ever lie to a reporter because they will find out, and when they do, things go bad really quick. And Going a, a little bit back to the, to the thing where if you're talking to a reporter and your company is aware of this and everything like that, imagine what happens if you lie. Does that look bad on you or does that look bad on your company? What if you weren't talking on behalf of your company but you were talking on yourself? Does that matter? No, it doesn't. It'll look bad at you. It'll look bad on your company. It'll look bad on all your peers and your associates and everything else. All because you said stuff you couldn't prove or you lied. And it's happened before. So just straight out the gate, take my advice. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Just stick to what you can prove, stick to what you know, and that's always going to go well for you. When it comes to interviews themselves, another thing is take your time. Don't try to rush questions and answers. Take your time with the interview. Think the question over and answer completely. Get your whole thought out there. If you're Doing a phone interview or an email interview, this is easier than you can imagine because you have all the time you need to just sit there and, and think it through. If a reporter talks to you in the hallway, 
<clears throat> and say they stop you, hey, I've got a quick question, you know, can you answer this, blah, blah, blah. Take your time. If you're going to, if you're going to answer questions and do the interview right then and there, take your time and talk. And don't be afraid to ask the reporter what their point is. What's your goal for this story? What's the idea of this story? What are you looking for with that question, that kind of question? Most reporters are going to be very open and honest and upfront with you. If we have a, a certain type of story we're trying to write, we're going to tell you because it's in our interest to try and get this as accurate as possible right out the gate. You know, having to go back and edit the story 15 or 16 times to adjust facts and fix quotes and things like this, it only, it only makes our day worse. And after a while, we get into a lot of trouble for it. If you don't know an answer, don't make it up. Again, don't do that. Don't do that. Just say, I don't know, but I will find out. And then follow up with that reporter. Get back to them as soon as possible because it makes you look good when you do. And also, it, it keeps you on task so that you're you're still being, you're still a part of the, the process. You don't want to just flake out because that, that kind of follows you around everywhere. Good. Okay, robust, scalable blockchain enterprise solution. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> Avoid jargon, acronyms, marketing buzzwords, and enterprise scalable, please. Uh, be enthusiastic about your topic, but Remember, your audience are people who don't work in this industry sometimes, or even if they do, there's so much overlap between buzzwords and, and acronyms and things like that, even within the same segment of the industry, that if you don't explain it in a clear way, how can you expect the reporter to understand what you're talking about? <laughs> don't get into the negative land. Don't let the reporter drag you down negative street because that can only get you in trouble. Don't talk about hypothetical situations if you don't have any idea how those hypothetical situations could really play out. That is often a way of a reporter shaping a story into what they want the story to be. Just deal in absolutes. You know, just don't deal in absolutes. Don't, you can't, there's no such thing as a 100% accurate answer to something. Make sure that you express that. Give nuance and force them to listen to nuance. If you get a tricky question that seems to be taking you down a dark alley, rephrase it. Bridge the uncomfortable topics off to something else where you say, I'm not aware of any such instance like that, but you know what's really important? This other thing. That's a good way to pivot from a negative question. During the conversation, drive the conversation. Try to push the journalist in the direction of the story as you see it. Give them good, solid facts that help them steer their questioning towards the actual truth versus some illusion they had when they came in to start the story. Repeat your points. Have your points ahead of time, as Steve was saying, and close strong on them. Emphasize what the real takeaways are, because otherwise, they'll make one up, probably. <laughs> Be careful when it comes to being paraphrased. This is the risk you run if you use that jargon before. If somebody doesn't understand exactly what you're saying, they may paraphrase you in a way that misrepresents what you said. So you need to make sure that you're clear and that you're quoted directly, if at all possible. This is why we encourage you to interact with journalists via email, because then you have a written record of the correspondence you had with them. Not to mention when you're talking via email, you can take your sweet, sweet time. Look at each question, weigh each answer. It's, it's, it's very beneficial. And for a lot of us, email is just faster. And, Exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah, you yeah, can no, copy and paste an email. No transcribing. And you know what? We will spell check it. <laughs> yeah. But, you know. We will correct our grammar. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll fix all the typos and stuff, but we'll, we'll cut and paste real quick. <laughs> Woo! Remember, <laughs> journalists in many ways are like people in InfoSec, in both in, for the good and for the evil. Okay? The best of journalism... We do ethical disclosure, we think about the context, 
We try to deliver the story that represents the truth. We try to make it the best case scenario and act for an audience on their behalf. Then there are people who do things to cause controversy and raise their page views. Because, oh my god, I can't believe he said that. Click. There's a broad spectrum of people from really solid professional journalists to people who have been writing for a few weeks and got picked up by some news site and now they've got the power of the keyboard in front of them. So keep that in mind. It's the same thing as the difference between your best InfoSec warrior white hat and a script kitty. Okay, we have journalism script kitties out there. Okay, and you have to be aware of who you're talking to before you enter into the conversation. And with that, we'll go to questions. Three journalists open the floor for questions. What happens next will shock you. Ask me anything. <laughs> anything. This man right here. <laughs> Ah, Project Veritas. You know, the funny thing is, I had a beer with that guy a couple of months ago. Just Did he take you? No, he didn't know who I was, and I only barely knew who he was. It was sort of being mutual friends. He's actually nice and kind of dorky in person, um, as you might imagine. But he really believes that there's a conspiracy in the media to undermine conservatives in this country. Facts have a political yeah. tilt. He, I mean, he's, he's, not just, he's not just stirring up trouble to stir up trouble. He really believes, what he, he really believes this stuff. Um, and that's kind of the issue. I don't know how to make them see otherwise. The only way we deal with them, with, with people like that, is by having reporters who go through the process of fact-checking their sources and by checking the backgrounds of their sources and talking to other people. A single source story will always leave you at the highest risk of having a bad story. So you have to do, you have to you have multiple source reporting, you have to do investigative background reporting, especially on a topic like the ones they've tried to drop, right? You've got to have somebody who's willing to dig into the substance of it and take the time. And that's another way the journalists are like hackers. You know, the definition of hacking and of journalism is we spend more time on something than the average person would, right, to find out what's going on. So There's uh, another one behind this yeah. and one over here. Next. All right, go. What do you do about reporters who don't Ooh. keep stuff off the record? So physical violence is frowned upon. <laughs> you absolutely should not do that. But the thing is, if a reporter burns you, if you go off the record with a reporter and they burn you, then you'll never talk to them again. But once it gets known, and you tell your friends and your peers, coworkers, everything, that this reporter burned you, you gave them something off the record. And well, guess who's never going to have another source or lead or anything come from you, your friends, your peers, your company, and everything like that? See, if I go off the record with you, but then use everything you did, I have literally burned that bridge. And InfoSec isn't as big as some people make it out to be. It's a very, very well-connected, very small community in some regards. And if you burn one, you burn a lot of people in the same day. Security yeah. Twitter burns. Yes, okay. so it, it does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, and, and, yeah, don't get us. We, 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 we would take that kind of thing very, very seriously. Yeah. We can't do anything. Of, okay. Another sorry. question over here. Wait, what? Um, I can either confirm or deny. I, I, that you is talk entirely to up to you, okay. who you, who you talk to. I, I, <laughs> Any comment about uh, what, what I think of that particular... Well, we're being videotaped. Yeah, so, this, so, this is being streamed. By the way, you are being yeah. taped. This is all on the record. And this is live. So, uh, so the, we can have interwebs. a conversation off stage afterwards about particular reporters if you really want to go there. We're on the record. But we're right on the now. record and we would never throw a fellow journalist under the bus. No. Mm -hmm. I just, I At just least not that. in public. <laughs> go, Jason. Uh, That's that's. You mean Rob? So so what about so you're asking what about journalists who like have one great source they go to all the time, right? No, he's that's called gonna... lazy journalism, right? Yeah. Okay. That's... And and there are people who make a career out of that. I I know of some. Okay. Um, but you know the way that you get around that is you go to other people who are also in that community in that journalistic community and you talk to them yeah. and you give them better stories. 
And we had a question over here. Sometimes. So, sometimes. Sometimes. So, sometimes. Some some are better than others. Yeah. Five, five six yeah. percent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, so there's there are people who are specialists in IT and in infosec PR who are good at their job. There are people who are also in this community who are okay at their job. Okay. And then there are the people who email me two days after on a story saying my CEO wants to talk to you about the story that you just wrote two days ago and give his impression of your story. That is not very helpful to me at all because I've already written the story. The story is already up there. Okay? I got one of those today. I am not going to go back and add a comment to the end. Update. CEO at Company X says, this is really what happened. I, that's not what's going to happen. So if you're going to, so you need to have a PR person who's like not going to be like reactive. They have to be proactive. They have to be out in front of things and prepare people to talk to the press in the right way. We actually have a very low. Very yeah, low. I'd depends. say it's twenty five. I mean, the, 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 there are some security firms that have in, in house PR. I'm being generous, but, okay? Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> we gotta get. Yeah. Yes, sir. If a, if a vulnerability has a logo and a website and a, and, mascot. and a mascot and fancy, like a theme song, things like this. Give me the t-shirt. I'm going to do. Uh, part of me gets stabby <laughs> and I really don't like it. But the practical side of me says that if it's a serious vulnerability in the public at large, that's what they need to learn about it to protect themselves. Then fine. Give them a logo, a theme song, and a, a fancy bear and a mascot. And we're, we're good. If we didn't have the Heartbleed logo, somebody would have made it. Okay. Yeah. And so, so there are some things that are dire enough that they need to be branded. Okay. But then there is this tendency to overbrand vulnerabilities, and you know, I'm not really fond of the ghost with a stick in its hand. Okay. I, I don't. I don't get that. Right. Um, what? I don't. The ghost I don't, with oh, oh specter. Specter. Yeah. Specter. Okay. okay. <laughs> like ghost with a stick in his hand. Yeah. What, what bone are you talking yeah, about? It was, it, was a, it was a branch. A branch. Uh, it's yeah. a branch. Okay. Yeah. I'm just. I was being. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> There was uh, another question over here, but yeah. go. So I think this PowerPoint, if you're dealing with British journalists and you're saying you're going off the record, journalists have to agree that it is off the record. Yeah. Yes. 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 Journalist the journalist has to agree that you're going yeah. off the record, well, and, you should, you, and yeah. you have to. And if the journalist does not agree that it's going off the record, you are not yeah, off the record. Shut up. Yeah. It has to be mutual, <laughs> okay. mutual you agreement. You are not off the record if you the journalist does away. Agree. It, it okay. helps if you <laughs> have the journalist say, this is off the record. Yeah, I they, agree that this is off the record. There, there's nothing yeah. wrong with requesting the journalist say that, yes, yeah. this is off the record. Yeah. So you physically hear that. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing, and we, we touched on this. Don't go off the record with a journalist you do not know. If you don't know them and trust them, and I don't mean I've known you for a couple of months, I think you're swell, yay, no. If yeah. you don't, haven't known them for years, that's probably a good idea to never go off the record. Don't put yourself in that position. Don't be a Marcus Hutchins. Yeah. And don't put us in that position either. We don't want to... We want to avoid off the record whenever possible because that's our jobs. You know, background is fine. Sometimes you need to be off the record, but for the majority of the time, we can't do that. Right. Except and for our conferences. Right. Well, so... <laughs> so let, let, so Again, yeah. we're being filmed. I know. Most of the conversations I, know. I, know I have that, yeah. with people, I start off off the record all the time. Until I say I'm on the record. I say, so we're off the record until, until we say we're on the record. If I have a glass in my hand and I'm at a bar, I'm off the record. Okay? If I am... In, I'm eating a meal with somebody. I'm off the record. Unless they explicitly tell me this is on the record. Because that's the only way in this community we can have a conversation with people and, and build knowledge, especially as reporters. You know, we are not domain experts. You know, even though Steve and I have both done tech stuff and, you know, and I've, like, waded through PCAP files and things like that, I do not consider myself an InfoSec expert, all right? I trust the knowledge of the people I meet in this room and at this conference and other conferences to help me learn what I'm going after in the future. And I have to have conversations off the record to learn that, right? But 
I also have to have a time where I step back and say, hey, all those great things you told me, can we structure that into something I can write about? Because I need to have the information yep. in a form that I can put it on the page so I get paid. One of the things that's a real challenge for us is when not to write a story. I hear and see a lot of things, but I have to, to learn, and I had to learn, what's news, what's relevant, and what's not. Just because somebody pulled off some hack and they're, they're having you know, fun and, and playing around does not mean I need to run to my keyboard and start writing up a story. You see, a lot of times, especially when, when it comes to dealing with the security community, what we write has serious impact. Our words have power over people and their careers. So we have to be really careful with what's, uh, what, what we write and how we write it and stick to only what's going to be relevant to the major public. You know, some kid playing a prank and putting googly eyes on the president's portrait while funny doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's news. We got about 10 minutes left, and then we're going to do a, a couple more calls, and we're going to be done. So I'll start with you and then come to, back to you. It, very good question. I'm glad you, a, you asked that. And I That's promise. never happened. <laughs> <laughs> question was, what happens if a reporter really gets it wrong? Like, they bombed it. They've misquoted you. They've got the story backwards. You know, they're talking about flying cars when you're talking about cups. It, it's just completely wrong. First thing you do is contact the reporter. Try to get all of the, 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 the things that are wrong corrected via them. That's your first step. But if they blow you off or nothing changes, then you'll want to talk to that reporter's editor. Usually editors, uh, by the time you get to that level, the editor's going to take care of things and it will get fixed. But, and, and it, this is sometimes, it happens, it's rare, the editor blows you off and nothing changes. At that point, it really depends. Do you want to fight or do you just want to let it go? If, if the story's out there, but it's kind of faded away, I mean, it, it kind of really depends on what, what, what's really wrong with the information. Because you can go up to the chain, you can go to the editor's boss, you can go all the way up to, to the senior management, the news org, and try to get this corrected. The one thing I don't suggest you do ever is actually attack the reporter in public, like call them out in, on social media or something like that, or try to go after them, because that only makes you look bad. Yeah, at least not at first. Yeah. After a while, you may have to actually do that, but I would not immediately start running. But I would also say that, you know, there is, there is a libel law in this country. Yep. Okay. So if it's a malicious misprinting, that's a totally different ballgame. Yeah. And you should address them immediately. I mean, a lot of times errors are introduced in editing just because we have non-specialist copy editors who edit our copy. And sometimes they may not like a word we use and they think it's the wrong word and they change it. Um, and so we have to fix it and go back and fix it. And, the, and so often we don't, find, we don't catch the problem until somebody calls us in and says, hey, he emails us and says, there's a problem with the story here, and we go fix it. One more question. We avoid, so the uh, question was, how scared or mindful are we when it comes to the legal department? And the answer to that is we avoid lawyers whenever possible. Um, it, every news org has them. And if, you, if your story gets called up in front of the lawyer, that's usually, uh, it, it could be proactive in many cases. They just want to make sure everything's on the up and up before it runs. And so a lawyer will, will look it over. Uh, sometimes lawyers will come in after the fact because somebody complained and, and threatened a lawsuit and lawyers look over the story and be like, nope, this is factual, that's journalism. Uh, so cease and desist letters, I've never actually had to experience that, so I don't know. Um, but I do know that cease and desist letters would invoke the lawyers immediately. And at that point, it's out of the journalist's hands. We have nothing to do or say. Most media organizations have well-paid retained law firms. Yeah. And they just handle that one thing. We have time for one more question over here.
we can tell you how we source things. So the question is, you know, if you see a, a, a disclosure on the web somewhere in a, in a Twitter post or something like that, how do you respond to it? And how do you source it out once that's happened? Do you contact the original source? We, I know I try to tr find the original source of the post. I try to talk to other people in the community to get a weight on how they feel about it. And we have enough expertise within the group of people that I normally deal with that I can feel confident about whether the post is accurate or not. We will follow up on the story as it goes along. The thing about the web is a story is never done until the website disappears from the face of the earth. The internet is forever and you can keep adding to a story. Uh, so I may write something with an initial take on something and saying I'm, ask, I'm looking for further comment from people and I list people I've already contacted, I haven't heard back from them yet. And then I will follow up the story with more information as it goes along. But I'm always trying to extend the stories I've already written. So that may be different for other people in other, other media. In broadcast, it's one and done. Okay, so they see it, they write a two-second script about it, the world is coming to an end because Intel chips have a vulnerability, the end. And then they go off to the next story. <laughs> and they won't ever follow up through those things. They're going to use the source they get initially, and then they're done. So that's our time. Thank you for coming out. But before we, we jump off the stage, I want to congratulate Paul oh. on completing his very first InfoSec talk. Woohoo! <clears throat> <laughs> sounds good, huh? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> He's done well. But again, it, uh, catch us out, outside if you want to talk or have any other follow-up questions. We'll be around uh, all weekend long, and uh, feel free to stop us. We're here all week. Try the veal. Yep. Tip your waiters. Thanks. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I missed a couple of things, but you caught up the cup of slug on that one. <laughs>